June 9th, 2022, Calvin Castine, don't move on me, Richard Frost, because that camera is not going to know you moved. <laughs> he ran away from me as soon as I pulled the microphone out. Uh, we were at the Champlain Meeting House, the beautiful downtown Champlain, and it's a Thursday night, and every once in a while they have a, a guest lecturer here, and tonight we're very fortunate to have a fellow that uh, I'm sure many folks in the North Country will recognize. Uh, your name, sir? Rich Frost. <laughs> and Rich, you also used another pseudonym for many, many years when you worked for the Press Republic in a little yeah. travel column. That was a long time ago. That I used the pseudonym Richard Landon when I first began my journalism career. And uh, back, I think I stopped doing that about 2002 when I had a book come out on Platt, in Plattsburgh. And I was told, okay, time to use your real name. <laughs> <laughs> Time to stop hiding behind that. I don't know. I work for Mark Twain. You yeah, know. <laughs> exactly. I think I, I use that as my excuse. But I woke up one morning on a, on a Sunday and in the, new, in the Press Republican, I had my picture. So that kind of ended the use of a oh. pseudonym. <laughs> so you have to admit what you've been doing. So how many books since then? The, this book is book number eight. Eight. And uh, it's the first. Well, I, I had a book. Uh, this is actually my third book in the last four years. Oh, so you've been busy. So I, I, I've been, yeah, somewhat prolific. Now, it, it, it depends on who you compare me to. I'm not going to show up well against John Grisham, but some other people, it sounds good. Okay, uh, so what's the, this one called that you're going to talk on tonight? Rich in History, a Champlain Valley reader. Um, it's based on the columns I do for Lake Champlain Weekly that I've been doing for about seven years on the history of the Champlain Valley. The book itself is a collection of 40 edited and sometimes completely rewritten columns. Uh, and out of that, I have picked, I will pick four or five to talk about tonight. Okay. And it'll, it'll depend on, number one, how long each segment goes, and number two, how restless the crowd turns out to be. But we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll get three or four, maybe five segments in. So after each segment, you've got a question and answer? Is that what you do? I, th or? I think I'll probably wait until the end okay. for that. Um, and again, I'll let the audience guide that. They're the people who are, you know, that we're doing it for. Right. So uh, how many stories are there in your book? About 40. About 40 of them. Okay. And where is it available? It's available in, I will say, all the bookstores in the county. I wish there were more of them. Both of both bookstores. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a, the three bookstores in Plattsburgh, Cornerstone, Lake City Books, and Bookburg, the one in the mall. Okay. It's available at the Champlain, uh, at the Clinton County Historical Association and the War of 1812 Battle of Plattsburgh Museum. And then it's available at the Keysville Pharmacy and at Cornerstone Pharmacy in up in the, nor on the northern tier. Yeah, Point, and so. for, and it, it's also available on Amazon. Uh, but I've been happy that most of the sales have actually been through local stores. And yet, at the same token, every now and then an order comes in from across the country, which is satisfying. Yeah. Well, especially if somebody's bought one before, then yeah. they might be looking for that Richard Frost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you always like to think so when you're a writer, but you're never really sure of that. Are you still neighbors with the uh, loaded toe? Yeah. Yep. They're, he, they're across the street. Yeah, Larry Gooley yep. and Jill, and uh -huh. they, uh, they also in the book business. So you know, more yeah, more full. I mean, full time in the book business, right. and they're both writing and publishing and distributing, and that's a big. That's a big load to, you know, to take on, to do yeah. all aspects of it. And, uh, uh, but it, it's got some advantages in terms of control of your product. And it's got some disadvantages because you always have, there's always a bigger company in the room. I mean, again, you have Amazon and I guess Barnes & Noble still has a national footprint. Yeah, so you, you got to do your own little niche and not be dictated by the big companies and what you're going to do. There's room to be. There's room to be independent. This book was was printed, was published and printed uh, through Kindle, through Amazon, and it does give an opportunity to somebody who is working with a smaller number of copies to have a a, a reasonable platform from which to work. I've also published three, two books through Bloated Toe, so I have nothing but praise for them as well. So everything you've done has been self-published, though. Or? In one way, or shape, or form. Uh, that's, that's also a challenge. That's a challenge, and it's a. It's a challenge, and and again, it's, 
um, per it, it is advantages. You get control over content. That's a big issue. Right. Um, you like to think if you get published in a traditional New York firm, that that also helps with marketing and distribution. The truth is friends of mine who have been published through those areas or those places tell me in this day and age, you got to go do your own marketing anyhow. Sure. A few big names they market, but it's not like it used to be right. in the business. And, and the other thing is we all read about writers, whether it be F. Scott Fitzgerald or somebody much less well known, who were kind of nurtured by editors over the years as they improved their writing skills. And that doesn't happen as much anymore. You have to come in with a little bit more completed, ready to go final product. And it varies with firms. I'm sure it varies with who you know. But uh, the traditional publishing businesses, uh, even when you're going through that, it's, it's still different than it was back when The New Yorker had its beginning and, uh, and, and was introducing a lot of people to the market. Now, you said uh, editing and so on. You just intrigued me here when you said earlier that you edited some of these where you just rewrote the whole article. The, uh, well, number one, you always find anytime, anytime you reread something you've written, mm -hmm. you've got, you, you immediately see ways you'd wish you would express it better. So if I'm going to reprint something I've used before, I, I always edit. Uh, number one, you find ways of expressing things that are different. Mm -hmm. Number two, sometimes you know more. I mean, it might be history, right. but new, thing, new information becomes available, and that's a factor. You certainly do it for, con you have to condense some and expand some. And for this book, in order to balance it out, I combined a few articles into one. I took excerpts from another and expanded it. And there's a couple of brand new chapters in the book that, that haven't been printed before. So it, it, it's a mix. What you're looking for, you have to come up with something thematically and, um, uh, and, and tailor the material to fit that. Okay. Well, the crowd is starting to arrive here. All the, all the, it's been quickly tripled, and it's all, always all good the, to see. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Rich, that we should know before we... No. I, I say in the book that this is going to be volume one because I was going to do it. Whether or not I ever get to volume two is uncertain, but I was, I, I was going to perhaps do a volume two, which is going to be people and places. This is more... Uh, it, the book's divided into four parts, um, and in order to make sure I have them accurate, one is early settlement, one is the military history, another one is transportation, and then the fourth section is industrial history. Uh, and so you certainly portray lots of people and places in doing that, but there are some unique personalities who I think merit more attention and who, are other, who don't get the recognition they deserve. And I think it's fun to do portraits of the communities around the lake. And I've written a lot of those in the past. I continue to write those. So if there is a volume two, that's what it'll be. It'll be communities and people and individuals. Okay, I can hardly wait. Okay, good. Right. Thank, thank Richard Thanks. Frost. Well, welcome again to the Champlain Meeting House and part of our author um, visit series. Uh, we invite local writers to come in every three or four months. And uh, Rich Frost is here. He's been here at least once before. Um, to talk about his new book. So I thank you all for coming, and I'll turn it over to him. Thanks okay. so much. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm gonna, we're going to do this a little bit differently because I learned that the batteries must be dead in the remote control. So the good thing is you're going to have the slides to focus on without necessarily having to look at me, but, uh, but I'm, gonna, I'm still going to ex expect you to listen to me very closely <laughs> as I go through this. The book, what I'm talking about tonight is in kind of support of my new book, which is called Rich in History, a Champlain Valley Reader. It's approximately 40 vignettes of history around here. Uh, I guarantee there's at least a few you don't know about, although I suspect some you know, something that everybody will know something about. Um, it fit, it's, it's based largely on the column I've been doing since 2013 for Lake Champlain Weekly, plus some of the travel writing I was doing before that for the Press Republican. I can assure you that uh, after all these years of doing this, I'm in no way close to running out of topics. They, they just keep coming. Plus, you also find out along the way 
that some of the history you tell people isn't true, and then you have to adapt. And uh, uh, I just found out one that was interesting. I have written before in the book that, in this book, which is a series of 120 walks around New York State, and that's what it is, it's not a hiking guide, but walks. And I wrote a, one on a town called Port Jervis, which is down at the place where New Jersey and Pennsylvania and New, and New York all meet. And that's where Stephen Crane lived for a long time, the person who wrote The Red Badge of Courage, which made, they made me read in high school, and I kind of enjoyed, but probably didn't appreciate, but which I reread several times, including about a year ago, and it's a really good book. And the thing that always amazed me, it's a Civil War story, but I was taught in school that he himself never went to war, and it was based on talking to soldiers. And when I was traveling in, to research that book, I learned in Port Jervis that he went to the park when they, got, when they dedicated a Civil War monument in the 1880s and spent the whole weekend talking to veterans, Civil War veterans from both sides there and used that as a long, large basis of his book. And I found out last week while researching him for another reason, it's now thought that story's not true. And he may or may not even have been in town when that ceremony was going on. So I guess I'm gonna, I, I'll have to probably go back and uh, uh, see if I can find some more information one way or the other. But uh, it's, you, you think it's a fact and you find it in multiple places and then you, then you find out when you take a closer look that maybe it wasn't a fact. Almost everything I'm gonna tell you tonight is gonna be true. I'll let you figure out what isn't. <laughs> and we'll go ahead. Now here's where I made my first mistake because I didn't ask for a list of who was coming. And so I'm actually going to talk about Samuel D. Champlain uh, with a certain amount of trepidation because I don't think anybody knows more about Samuel D. Champlain than Celine. But I'm still going to give my spiel on Samuel D. Champlain. That's <laughs> all right. Um, the picture is blurry. But it's kind of interesting because there's probably no picture of him in existence. And obviously this was before the time of photography, but as best I can tell, there was no portrait done during life of Samuel D. Champlain. This was published in the 1830s, 1840s as a, as a lithograph of Samuel D. Champlain. The Library of Congress says this is a fake. It was highly successful, but it's a fake. That's what I'm told. The next picture I have of Samuel D. Champlain uh, is where I'll kind of start talking a little bit more. This was done by an artist, it was a, a, an illustrator named Haskell Coffin, and this was done and hung in the telephone building in Plattsburgh. It now hangs at Champlain, or at Clinton Community College. And again, it may or may not be anything what, like what he looks like, but the thing that irritates me is it shows him in military gear and that's how everybody remembers Champlain. And we all remember that there was a battle with some Native Americans on Lake Champlain, and he killed a few, and I'll talk about that. But the truth is, from my reading about him, this is, of all the explorers we learned about, this is the guy who least deserves to be remembered for militarism and killing people and having a haughty attitude towards people who are already in North America. In fact, he... He was pretty tolerant of other cultures. He grew up in a town in France called Rouage, and there were both Protestant and Catholic populations there. He never understood why people fought so bitterly about religion, um, which made him probably a minority in that time. Rouage was also a port. It was an area where fishermen could get salt, because if you were going to go out to the cod trade, you had to have salt to bring it back. So ships would stop in this town both on the way to the cod, uh, the cod beds in the Atlantic and on the way back. His father was a fisherman, gradually rose to the point of owning his own boat, and he presumably learned a little bit of his nautical knowledge uh, that way. Somewhere along the way, he, he got a mentor. I can't find out exactly how it happened, and again, I, 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 we may be able to get some blanks filled in it's nice having people who have different, who have other perspectives on him. But the person who mentored him later turned out to be the king of France, 
Andre the Fourth, um, who himself believed in religious tolerance, ordered religious tolerance in the country, um, and and undoubtedly helped Champlain rise a little bit faster than he might have in terms of what he was able to do later in life. The 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 thing that he was probably uh, allowed to do that led to his biggest opportunity was to do what's called, with quotation marks, in all the books I can find, special services for the king at some point. And as best I can tell, these special services were trips across the Atlantic to the Caribbean and perhaps into Mexico to see how the Spanish were treating the, were treating the native peoples. This was an issue even back in the late 1500s. And, this, and some of the Spanish conquistadors were brought to trial in Spain for their, for their uh, depredations on the natives in, uh, in the Americas. It's a little bit unclear, to me at least, how he managed to do this and get away with it, because I'm sure the Spanish would not have looked well on it. And, but, he, but he did. Um, I, what one writer said is what he came away with was sort of a philosophy of how not to run a colony should he ever have a chance to run one himself. So anyhow, he did get his chance to run a colony. I put this in, it, it's a map he drew. I just wanted to remind people back in those days, somebody who was going to sail a ship across the ocean would also be, uh, would probably be able to design maps because it's not like you could go pull out a GPS, it's not like you had good books of maps. He himself was an excellent cartographer and if you look at it, some of his early maps of places you would recognize like Cape Cod, I don't think I could go out on a boat and come up with a way to draw those shapes on a map even now. I might be able to do it if I was far enough up in the air looking down, but he, he was a skilled cartographer. Uh, I won't get to that. He first landed where the Saguenay River comes down into the St. Lawrence. And he established, he tried to establish a colony there. And suffice it to say that over a short period of time it didn't work out. He made another trip in which he established what's sort of considered <clears throat> the first French, formal French colony in North America. And this was on the western coast of Nova Scotia. It's near the current town of Annapolis Royal. It was called Port Royal. It's actually been reconstructed as a historic site. And like any settlement in those times, it looked like as much of a fort as it was a place to live because there was always a concern about protection against native populations. At the same, term, at the same token, he had learned a lot about native cultures before he came to North America. And he was both ready and anxious to both start trading with native populations and getting to know more about how they lived. Port Royal, he had a lot of concern about not just settling there, but how to keep the colonists happy. He set up what he called the Order of Good Cheer. Essentially, it was like a dinner club. It's not like he had many other places to go for dinner. You're in this remote area, but he wanted to make it a little bit of a festive occasion. It also gave him a chance to show off one thing he learned from the Spanish, is that you got to keep using fresh food, otherwise you're going to deal with scurvy or other issues. And so he gave him a chance to demonstrate the value of fresh foods. He even went a step farther in order to organize a theater group. And so the first play in North America was put on during the short period of time that Port Royal was functioning. Ultimately, this also was a failure. This was 1605. On his next trip, he went farther up the St. Lawrence, and this time ended near a rocky prominence that we currently know as Quebec City. This became the first permanent French settlement in North America. This is the one that you know, he's best known for today. He, um, again, put into play some of the tactics he knew as far as maintaining morale. Uh, he was ready to learn from the natives. He had learned about fresh food and, and fruit, particularly citrus fruit from the Spanish, 
from the natives, he was more than willing to use snowshoes. He learned how to canoe and how that gave him more versatility on waterways. He tended to be lenient because he wanted his men to uh, be anxious and ready to do the work that was necessary. At the same token, if he had to be firm, he could be firm. He found out about a mutiny, identified the culprits, had a trial put on, and, one of the, and they were sentenced to uh, death by hanging. After the first one was hanged, he had some uh, apprehensions about that, sent the others back to Europe, and got a second trial for them. And they were actually, I, I, I can't remember the exact details, but they were not executed, they were punished in some way, and allowed to continue their lives. And it shows, it's kind of, again, different than what do you think of when you read about some of the explorers. He was able to show firmness, do what he had to do to keep an enterprise going, but never lost the compassion you need uh, to, to gain the respect from people around you. Lake of the Iroquois, he heard about early from the natives he met. He met initially the Montagne. He started meeting Montagne peoples when it was at Cadissac, later met some of the Huron Indians or natives as, as whatever term we want to use. Uh, those peoples he got along well with, but their adversaries were the Iroquois and particularly the Mohawks. And he heard stories relatively soon after he came to North America about a long north-south lake south of the area that he had settled that was called Lake of the Iroquois. In 1609, the Indians with whom he was allied were having difficulties with raids, particularly by the Mohawks, on their lands. And they asked Champlain to go with them to see what they could do to either negotiate or punitively enforce some kind of rapprochement with them. So he went with some of the Manye and Huron natives down what we now know as the Richelieu River, and that was called the River of the Iroquois, into the Lake of the Iroquois. And he has had that name, lake named after him, and that's the name we've known it, known it by ever since. The fact that it was called Lake of the Iroquois first shows you it wasn't Champlain who first discovered the lake. He happened to be the first white European to see the lake, and that gave him a chance to have the name. Some were going south on Lake Champlain, and depending on which book I pick up, either at Crown Point or Chimney Point or Ticonderoga or someplace, uh, they ran into some Mohawks. Initially, they tried to have a parley. It became clear this was not going to be a peaceful situation. And Champlain himself picked up what's called an arquebus, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but ar or arquebus. Um, it was a pretty primitive gunpowder using gunpowder driven instrument. But for all practical purposes, it was the assault weapon of the early 1600s. He shot it once, shot it once and killed two Mohawk chiefs and one other person. Another person on his, with him, shot another arquebus and killed another chief. Obviously, I mean, the Iroquois had never seen anything like this. One can only imagine, you know, the devastation of seeing people killed in that sudden and, and terrible way. Um, the, that's what gets pictured when you read about Champlain in the book. There's always a picture of this shooting and, and, and the natives falling to the ground. And again, it's just, I, I, I just think it's very, very unfortunate that that's what this guy gets remembered for. Because again, he was probably the most peace-loving and the most interested in getting along with all the natives of any of the explorers that I've read about. Um, he didn't stop with just, he, he never came back to Lake Champlain, by the way. He did go back to Quebec, where he spent most of the rest of his life. But it's not like he was stuck just on the St. Lawrence River. Over time, he explored Lake Huron and Lake Superior. And uh, I look at it as just an extraordinary accomplishment that this man was so well-traveled. Um, he didn't get that far south around the Americas. He did get around Maine and Mount Desert Island and, and Cape Cod but didn't go any further south, at least that I'm aware of. One of the things that set him apart is that, unlike earlier people coming from elsewhere, other European explorers, he wasn't looking to establish a fishing fleet. He was not necessarily looking to do just the fur trade. 
He wasn't out there looking for a product and a project. He was determined to help establish a permanent colony. And that's one thing that made him different and made him look for more long-term strategies. And in fact, he appreciated the lumber that was available and thought about ways that lumber might become, that, that wood, wood based industry might become a way to uh, support a colony in North America. Um, it's kind of interesting. He became a little bit of what we would call an anthropologist or an ethnographer. I mean, he really tried to systematically study some of the people he met and understand a little bit more about them. Uh, it would probably not go well in, in the current political climate, but he said, he always assumed that there would be intermarriage between the French who came over and some of the natives, and that over time, whether it be years or centuries, it would become sort of a blended civilization that would live peacefully and, and prosper because of the natural resources available in North America. Um, as you all well know, he's been honored a few times. In 1609, he, the first centenary of the discovery of that lake was celebrated with great fanfare by uh, Britain, France, and the United States. Two statues were commissioned from that. One is this one. This is an old postcard, a Detroit Publishing Company postcard uh, of the one that's in downtown Plattsburgh. The other one that was commissioned, and this is a lousy picture of it, but it's in the lighthouse. Uh, there, there, that is also, there was a statue and a monument to Champlain in the lighthouse, and uh, there's even a, the French government sent over a sculpture by Auguste Rodin to be, and that's incorporated into that, into that sculpture. But there's other places. Uh, this is on uh, Isle of Mott. This is near St. Anne's. This is, this is a statue that commemorates him. And you know I'm not going to get out of Champlain without pointing out that you have one of the earliest statues right here. The earliest. And it is, yeah, the earliest. And uh, uh, with a historical marker from the commemoration to prove it. And so you all probably have seen it, but it is just around the corner from where we're talking right now. Okay. Oh, I like this. This is the person who wrote about him, a uh, Canadian historian. Champlain relished the discovery of others as it did new lands. He embodied the spirit of tolerance. His ambition be, could be summed up with a, with a word that really looks like reconnoiter, to note and accept what distinguishes one man for another. He was interested in, in the natives as people, and it set them apart. And he really, I... I Particularly in the book Champlain's Dream by David Hackett Fisher, he really brings this brings this part of uh, this part across very very well. And like I say, I'm sorry that so many of the people I talk to about Champlain, what they know is about the conflict, that one day of conflict with natives down on the southern part of the lake. Okay, I mean this is uh, New England grants. It's actually, this is a mistake, it's New Hampshire grants. And so I was here a few years and I was writing articles and I did some articles in Vermont history and they kept talking about the New Hampshire grants. And because I already knew everything back then, I figured I don't need to know about New Hampshire, I'm studying Vermont. But after running into the term frequently enough, I began to realize I'm dealing with something different. That's the monument in Bennington. And the reason I'm using Bennington is because Benning Wentworth was the governor of New Hampshire. In the 1800, oh, I want to say, and I have my notes because I don't remember dates ever, but somewhere around the 1740s, he started giving land grants west of New Hampshire, west of the Connecticut River. Uh, Bennington is named after him, and there were other land grants. New York immediately objected. Governor Clinton pointed out that his land grant for New York covered all the way from all the way to the Connecticut River and would include would include some of Vermont. I'm missing something out the window. I'm sorry, that little no. groundhog keeps going up. Uh, uh, we can send up friends for him if you want for our gardens. <laughs> Anyhow, there was enough argument with Benning Wentworth establishing colonies west of the Connecticut River, New York 
saying that was it was illegal, uh, that arguments and, uh, and and confrontations began. Wentworth said that he thought the border of New York and Massachusetts was should be extrapolated north, and that would give him all that territory east to, to Lake Champlain. And I have a map. So you can see the Connecticut River, I'll have to look them up front. The Connecticut River forms much of the border of Vermont and New Hampshire. So I from New Hampshire, he's claiming all this land, saying that this border that was established with New York should also include that, this border coming up should have just been driven further, and all of this should be part of New Hampshire. New York argued that its grant covered everything from the Connecticut River this way. So it doesn't take a skilled cartographer to realize it's not going to work this way. They appealed to the king. They said it had to be dealt with. And for reasons that are unclear to me, instead of getting this done right away, Clinton and Wentworth, instead of texting the king and getting a quick resolution, sent a party over by ship. And it took a year or two for him to come back. Meanwhile, New York kept selling land in that area, and New Hampshire kept granting grants, to, kept making grants for new communities. By the time the king made his, his, his uh, ruling, he had, Benny Wentworth had established about 100, 100 towns in that disputed area. The king finally said, New York's right, it all goes to the Connecticut River, and all that land belongs to New York. Well, you got lots of people who own the land over there in, in, uh, on that side of the Lake Champlain. They thought maybe if they just worked hard and kept it themselves, there wouldn't be any problem. But New York said, we'll be happy to let you keep that land. All you have to do is pay us all over again for the land. New York being magnanimous in terms of its strategy there. A few people probably paid if they could afford it just to get rid of the hassle and get a New York deed. Some people probably couldn't afford it. And a gentleman who became known for other things, Ethan Allen, who lived here in this house, and may have started with a group of friends in a bar. I think there's about 20 bars in Vermont that claim the Green Mountain Boys started there. But they were ready to fight for some of this land, and there were confrontations uh, on both sides. And it turns out Ethan Allen and his brothers owned about 60,000 of those disputed acres along the Winooski River, so they had their vested interest in it. So it's really where he got some of his training for his, his role in the American Revolution. There was one point where there was what's called the Westminster Massacre. There was some land that wasn't being turned over in Westminster, Vermont, and a sheriff from New York came over to enforce the New York law. And for the first time, shots were fired, and one Vermonter or one person living in a New Hampshire grant was killed. And finally, people said, we've got to come up with a way to settle this. They never really did, though. What helped, or, or finally put an end to all this, is the American colonies starting to rebel against England. And Vermont, or the, and by the way, I'm using the word Vermont. That name hasn't been in history yet, but the time I'm talking about. This was all called the New, Am New Hampshire Grants area, and that, that was the name. Vermont was some, you know, figure, figment of imagination in somebody's mind. This was the New Hampshire Grants. But all those people uh, in the New Hampshire Grants decided as much as they hated New York, they hated the king more. So they wanted to fight with the 13 colonies. This, explain, this will help explain why they weren't one of the original 13 colonies because at that point they weren't organized to that degree. Um, during the revolution, they applied to be one of the colonies. New York said, fine, pay us, as long as you pay us for all the land grants, you can have the colonies, you can have that land. Uh, Massachusetts argued as well, but uh, New York was more fervent. And so Vermont was not granted admission to the, admission to the Republic at that point and it declared its independence in 1777 with its own constitution. They bragged appropriately about it being the first of the American states to outlaw slavery. That was a big part of that constitution. Um, 
the name Vermont did come in then. That's when the name Vermont came from the term, the French term for Green Mountain. Although before they named it Vermont, they were going to name it New Connecticut. And apparently somebody had already used that name elsewhere, so that was taken out of the, out of the list that was available. They were having some, first of all, they were frustrated because they couldn't join the Union. The second thing was that there had been some British raids on territory in, New, in the New Hampshire grants and also some Indian raids. It got to the point where a group of people, maybe or maybe not including Ethan Allen, approached the Governor General of Quebec and said, how about we make a deal and you make Vermont part of Canada, we'll stay with the British and, uh, and, and you can help us solve this New York land argument and plus, you keep a little bit more of an anchor going south from the Canadian border. It's hard to know how much uh, came out of that. Uh, but in 1790, New York finally said, tell you what, for $30,000, you can join the Union. Give us $30,000 as a, as for the land claim. And $30,000 in 1790 was no small sum, I'm sure. But that's, that, that's ultimately what happened. They probably made that $30,000 back easily in a way because after the revolution, one of the things Alexander Hamilton did is he consolidated all the debts of all the states into a national debt because he felt a new country, if it didn't pay its debts, wasn't going to have any recognition in the world. But he also thought that it wasn't fair to have states where all the battles were handle all of the debt. And, and so it was nationalized. But Vermont, because they came in later, never had to participate in the payment of the debt. So they may have made more than $30,000 in the deal. What else do I have here? So that's how Vermont came into the Union. And that was what the, that, that's how the dispute was finally resolved between New Hampshire and New York. I've got, it's 40 vignettes in this book. You're not going to hear all 40. I haven't decided yet how many you're going to hear. But the next one you are going to hear is this one. Uh, this is the boat I went on. This is out of Basin Harbor in Vermont. This was a cruise that was organized by the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Anytime you have a body of water, you can be sure somewhere or another a boat has gone down to the bottom of it. And I lived for four years in North Carolina, so we heard all about the shipwrecks on Lake Hatteras. Uh, I know people who live in Detroit hear about the shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. There's an awful lot on the bottom of Lake Champlain some of it dating back almost to Champlain's time, and, or actually before Champlain's time, and actually even including one airplane from the 1940s or 1950s. But there's a state park run by Vermont called the, New York, the, called the Vermont State Underwater State Park. And they've tagged a bunch of shipwrecks. And these buoys are out there. I'm not a scuba diver, so I'm never going to have a chance to see these things unless somebody comes up with a new strategy and the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum offered boat rides and radio controlled cameras. And so we, you have to go all the way to Basin Harbor and then you come back to the New York side. This is near Split Rock. And the boat that's on the bottom of this one, this was a steamboat that went ashore at full speed into the rocks near Split Rock on the New York side. Later it was found out that the captain probably was using a little bit too much morphine for his gout and probably wasn't even aware of what he did. One of the things that amazes me is that all the passengers survived and even most of the cargo was, was gotten off. And this was probably because it was relatively shallow water around there, but there were no casualties. Over time, it became a tourist attraction. People would come out on Sundays because this thing was up against the shore for a long time. Eventually, the owners of the ship salvaged everything they could out of it. Uh, there are bars in the Port Henry area that claim the wood for the bar came from this ship, et cetera, et cetera, and then it was allowed to sink. Originally, this boat was built for an interesting purpose. Before it being converted to a passenger steamer, it was a steamboat that was designed to take trains from St. Albans across to Plattsburgh. And essentially, in those days, bridges were expensive and rail, rail advanced much more quickly on the Vermont side of the lake. And then on the New York side, there wasn't a connection for quite a while from say the Whitehall or the southern part of Lake Champlain up to Plattsburgh. But there was a line that went from Montreal over to Moores. 
and train. And so this boat was built heavily enough to carry rail cars that would literally be driven onto the ship and then taken off on the other side. And so when you go down and you see this wreck, it's really, really impressive to see uh, how much is, is still left. And you can get, we saw cross-sectional views and uh, these timbers uh, are, are just remarkable for their size. This is the prelude. This is not my story. My story is something like this. They found a ship on the bottom of Burlington Bay some 25 years ago and they had no idea what it was. Usually they're finding canal boats, whether they be sail canal boats or boats that were pulled by the mules that we all read about, but they couldn't find any information on this one. It took a while, the boat was found in, in 1983. It took a while, but they finally found out it was something called a horse ferry. And it sounded fine to me. You figure, okay, you have a ferry to take the horses across, but that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about a horse pushing the ferry across. This is a later adaptation. I couldn't, I mean, there's not a whole lot of pictures of these, but they were not rare. It turns out that there were actually patents on various kinds of horse ferries. They were used by 1800. These were used between Manhattan and Brooklyn, ferries driven by horses. Uh, they later were used on the St. Lawrence River. A lot of them were used around Montreal so that farmers could get their produce and their animals from the mainland across to the island of Montreal. And there were plenty of them on Lake Champlain. Uh, there were some that ran from Port Henry to Chimney Point. There was one that ran for 20 years from Essex to Charlotte. Interestingly, the ride took about 30 minutes, which is just about what the ride takes now uh, across the lake. And what they had was kind of a central pole, and then horses were attached, and the horses would walk around in a big circle. And I've seen the same exact operation in sorghum operations in the South. Back when I was living in Kentucky, you have the mules walking around in a circle, and in the center you have this post, and it's grinding the sorghum so that you get the, the liquid out that can be boiled down to make molasses. The big problem with that is that you need a lot of room for those horses to go in a big circle. So these were pretty wide boats. And what they realized also was not only did you need a really wide boat, but if you had horses walking around this whole circle, there wasn't very much room for cargo, so they didn't make much money. A guy from Whitehall patented his new invention. And it was a turntable underneath the boat. So, I, and I don't have a picture of one, but if you can imagine this boat, with a turntable underneath, for those who remember what a turntable is from the days of LP or you know vinyl records, and it was a slot on each end of the boat, so you'd have the horses, and the horses would just walk in place the whole time, turning the turntable, and then you know, and then you had all the gears and pulleys and everything attached to a, a I'm blanking on the name of uh, of this of the a wheel on the side of the paddle wheel, and that's how the boat would work. And in fact, the boat they found at the bottom of Burlington Bay was one of those turntable boats. The next advance was the treadmill. And that's what this is, uh, is, is the treadmill. Um, and you could have a two horsepower treadmill, you could have a four horsepower treadmill. Some boats that did long, longer journeys actually kept extra horses on board. Uh, so at least now, you, you always have to take on faith with a car dealer tells you, but on these boats, you know if it was four horsepower or two horsepower. <laughs> and uh, they, they, one of the things they uh, had to do was make sure if they had a wheel on each side of the treadmills, you had to keep the horses in cadence so that the boat wouldn't turn. You would think that as soon as steamboats came around, and remember I'm talking 1790, 1810, 1820, that steamboats would obviate these but the truth is, um, steamboats take a while to start up. If you're making that 30 minute ride across, by the time you get a steamboat started up, the horse ferry probably could go to Charlotte and back. And so as a result, particularly around Montreal, uh, the farmers found that these horse drawn or these horse ferries were still very practical and were very inexpensive. Uh, eventually, they, eventually they did uh, go out of, you know, they did get phased out. But I thought it was interesting that as recently as the 1920s, there was still a horse-operated ferry on a river in Tennessee, on the Cumberland River. Hmm. Uh, they did go to the West. It was an American invention. Uh, 
the Romans had them. The Romans had it. Nobody knows if the Romans built them, but the Romans actually had plans for oxen-driven battleships. Uh, and, and I've come to realize it doesn't matter what you think of, the Romans already thought of it. But as far as uh, being practically used, it was an American invention. And it did go as far as west. One of these horse ferries operated across the Mississippi near St. Louis. So that's my unusual form of transportation. Now I'm going to decide, what time is it? Oh, wait a minute, i got to watch. 7.12. I'm going to do one more. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to make this audience participation to tell me what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to do one of these three. I'm going to talk about murals, or I'm going to talk about graphite industry, or I'm going to talk about movie making in the region. Anybody got a preference? Movie making. Who? Movie making. Uh, because okay. <laughs> well, there's a community in graphite that's why we hear about graphite the pencils. Yeah. Well, I uh, uh, I can talk about any of them. I don't know if I can give you a choice because you can give these anything. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. No, I'll do whatever anybody wants. I'll do graphite. I'm happy to do graphite. Okay, I'm going to do graphite. That's okay. what I'm going to do. Graphite yeah. sounds good. Okay, so I have to find it. <laughs> I mean, again, these are it's. Oh no, I see what I have to do now. I stopped the show. Okay. This is downtown Ticonderoga. It's the last, second to the last industrial building left. This was actually the Ticonderoga Pulp and Paper Company. And until they built what they called the new mill, which has now been there quite a while, uh, it became also the office for international paper. The reason I put this there is the only place outside of this talk, you can easily learn about the graphite industry. Graphite's been around forever, and English shepherds were known to use graphite to sort of brand their sheep, probably a more humane way of branding an animal than what we developed for cattle in the American West. In Chilson, right near Ticonderoga, people began noticing in the early 1800s sort of a black scum on top of the snow at the end of the spring. But, and, and wondered what it was, and it became clear that it was this mineral they didn't really know a lot about. Eventually, some industrial uses were found, and graphite started to be mined in the Ticonderoga and Hay area. Many small graphite mines were set up. Eventually, they were amalgamated as the American Graphite Company, and their headquarters were in Ticonderoga. And you begin to realize Ticonderoga was a pretty bustling place major paper mm -hmm. distributor later, major in the graphite industry, also had, uh, had iron works. It, it, it was part of the prosperity of that area. Um, and then they also built a refinery. I'll get to that in a second. So let me enter one person. Joseph Dixon lives in Marblehead, Massachusetts, shipping town. More observant than I might have been as a kid. But even as a kid, he noticed all these ships going back and forth to Asia, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. And the ships would go across with goods being made in the United States, might be coming back with some Chinese export porcelain, but often came back with graphite to be used as ballast. And he said, there's got to be a way to make some money off this stuff if you're shipping it across the Pacific Ocean. And he started tinkering and found it was a great stove polish. I don't know why he needed sexy ads to sell soap polish in the 1880s, but he chose to do it this way. He found that there were other uses, uh, and it became called the Joseph Dixon Crucible Company because graphite was able to tolerate high temperatures, so it had a role in the iron industry. He bought out the American Graphite Company. In 1860, he bought out the graphite company in 1863, or 1873. He took over their refinery. Not only were they mining graphite in that area, but the American graphite had built a mill, a refiner, a, a refiner, a, you know, refinery mill to make the final product of graphite. Dixon took it a step further because he realized pencils might have a role. Anything you could write with, he, the, the lesson of it being used to mark cheap, that stayed with him. The British apparently found that graphite itself 
was a very inconvenient thing to write on paper with. But they found that by mixing graphite powder with the right amount of clay, you could get something that was stable and would leave the mark that you wanted on, on paper. The Italians came up with the idea of putting a wood casing around the lead uh, or the graphite for a pencil. And the hexagon that we all grew up with is actually the one unique American part of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Dixon started manufacturing pencils in his company in Jersey City. And he got to the point within, oh, just a few years, and we're talking in the late 1850s, he was good, they were good enough at it, they could sell pencils for a nickel. Sounds cheap, except the nickel was worth a little bit more back then, and it didn't take off. Like so many industrial improvements, it took off when the war started. When the Civil War came, officers welcomed something that was more, more convenient than a quill pen. And he got to the point, by the end of the Civil War, his factory could manufacture 86,000 pencils a day. And it took off from there. Somewhere along the line, and we're talking in the 1880s, yeah, here, here's just another ad, the Joseph Dixon Crucible Company, but I can tell you a lot more people know him for the pencils, which were the Dixon Ticonderoga pencils mm -hmm. that we all grew up with. And if you ask your friends in California, they grew up with the same pencils. This is really one of the best known brands in the world. Okay, more Dixon Pencil Company. So in the 1880s, somebody discovered a huge graphite uh, deposit about 8 or 10 miles west of, of Hague. And they started digging. Uh, it was found to be a huge bit of graphite. The mine was 600 feet long. And they also had a deep mine that went down 200 feet mining graphite. Employed hundreds of people. Uh, Dixon built a company town for three or 400 people, built a school, built churches, built two baseball fields, because apparently one wasn't enough, but they had a traveling baseball team that played the other cities in the region, uh, had a dance hall, uh, had paymaster's office, had a brothel, had anything you needed in an area. And they were pulling out so much graphite to ship to Ticonderoga, they decided why ship it to Ticonderoga? He built another refinery here at the town of Graphite. And this was the largest graphite mine in the world until the end of the 20th century. Um, the, I'm trying to think of a way to... Uh, I got interested in this because as a kid, I found the ruins of this when I was on a hike. And, and I'll talk a little bit about where that is. But it was remarkably prosperous. They pulled out millions of pounds of graphite a year. Uh, the numbers don't really, the numbers are in the book, but you know, we're not going to remember the numbers. And then they got hit by the economy around the world. Other places were able to mine it more cheaply. And even though they were bringing it by boat, um, they uh, were still able to undersell what they could do here. We're talking even bringing it to Ticonderoga. So the graphite mines kind of suddenly closed in about nine, somewhere around 1915, 1920. The refinery was closed down. Interestingly, only 10 years earlier, the refinery had burned, and they rebuilt it immediately that same year. It was that thriving in industry. Um, they did continue. Dixon continued his refinery operation in Ticonderoga. It remained a major player. And that's a refinery, remember, that opened in 1863. That operated over a century. From 19, about 19, late 1920s to 1968, it operated with foreign graphite. They were bringing in graphite from Africa and Asia to supply that plant. When, when they closed the town of graphite, uh, they raised all the buildings. They got rid of everything. And if you drive on Route 8 from Ticonderoga across to, say, Brant Lake, uh, you'll pass the Dixon Memorial Forest. It doesn't have formal trails, but this is I was wandering around there as a kid, <clears throat> as a teenager, with friends and not really knowing what I was in, but but knowing I was finding mine shafts. So they probably should have had it posted in some way to keep people like me out. <laughs> but I met a guy who had worked there and he explained the whole operation to me and gave me a walking tour. And we saw foundations and he showed me this was how you got down to the mine. 
This is where the dance hall was. This is where the paymaster's office was. And he explained, this is where we went on Friday night to get paid. It, it was really fascinating to me that this big operation was there. It's all gone. And unfortunately, it, it, it really has never been, it's not interpreted well. People should learn about this. And that's why I, I put that museum on there. That's a picture inside the mine. Um, again, 600 foot long mine. Just to give you a close up, um, it, it's kind of like they mined coal in the south. They used to mine all they could, but they'd always leave a, a post to keep it from collapsing. Graphite strikes me as being kind of, you know, material that would flake pretty easily, so I'm not sure how safe these were. But interestingly, I never read about a mine accident in the 30 or 40 years the town of Graphite was open. If you get any atlas or any road map that's more than about 20 years old, it'll still have the village of graphite on it. And if you get out a copy of the Press Republican from the 1890s to about 1915, and you go to the society page, they will have a column on what's going on in Champlain, what's going on in Moores, and they'd also have what's new in graphite. Hmm. Wow. So Marty and I went hiking one day. We started at Putnam Pond State Campground, and I had a lead and, uh, to an abandoned graphite mine. So we're hiking in, it was a great hike for our dogs because you go by four ponds. It was about three or four miles, not difficult, a little bit longer than we planned on. And we didn't find this, but if we had come 70 years earlier, that's what we would have found. And it was a processing plant as well. We found stone ruins that were clearly multi-story. This was not on a highway, this was on a, a very narrow trail in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but this had been an operation we did find this, it's not us, we did find this, and that's the entry to the mine. And there's still water coming out of that, it's probably a mix of, I don't know what it is, but it has, it's iron laden because it's brown water that comes out. What we did find is the largest boiler I'd ever seen in my life. And it was the boiler that fired the plant to heat the water to, to use in the processing of the graphite. I later found out that this was called the Rocktown Mine. It operated from 1901 to 1907. As was often the case in newspapers at that time, it said this mine will probably become the largest graphite operation in the world. It didn't, and uh, it was gone within five years after changing owners three times. But it's a remarkable artifact to see this out there in the middle of nowhere. I can't find my picture, my picture of, the, uh, uh, of the boiler, but I have a wonderful picture of Marty standing next to the boiler. And it really shows you how big this contraption is. And it made clear why they weren't going to bother to move it out. They just yeah. leave it there for hikers to discover. So there still is evidence of it. Uh, apparently, there were graphite deposits that were found around all sable chasm and around split rock, but nothing that was ever mined commercially. Dixon Ticonderoga pencils, which is the reason I brought this up. So I'm going to stop. Next time I talk, I'll talk about movies. But I, so, and all I'm really trying to do is remind us, there's a remarkable amount of history here, and it needs to be looked at. And I, uh, when it comes to Champlain, I, I, he's, he's somebody who I think the more you read about him, the more fascinating he is. He's a very, I mean, he, he's a very important uh, historical entity. And, uh, uh, and like I said, it just bothers me that he's remembered solely for almost solely for military exploits, or so frequently for military exploits. When it comes to the New Hampshire grants, uh, this is what got Ethan Allen steamed up <laughs> about politics. And uh, his antipathy for New Yorkers uh, was that later challenged usefully as antipathy towards England. Um, and I had never realized until then that New York was given a grant that went all the way over to New Hampshire. And, and that's the way it might have been had Benny Wentworth not decided he was going to actively start colonizing the, the territory to his west. Uh, the horse ferry I just find fascinating. And partly because I didn't know anything about it, but even the people at the Lake Campaign Maritime Museum dug, found this boat, had no clue what it was. It took them a year or two to, to figure it out. And it turns out these things were not uncommon and were pretty widespread. And graphite, this was a big industry and uh, there's no trace left. And yet, you're not going to find anybody, or it's not going to be easy to find anybody who's never used a Dixon Ticonderoga 
pencil. And every time you see one of those things, you remember that heritage. The Ticonderoga wasn't just picked out of the blue. This is where the company was and, and was headquartered. Although, again, the graphite was refined in Ticonderoga. The pencils were manufactured in Jersey City. And in fact, when they shut down the refinery here, uh, the refinery burned in 1968, and they just chose to re rebuild the refinery next to the pencil plant in Ticonderoga. I don't think that operates anymore down there either. I'll stop. So you've all been very, you're, you're all very attentive. And, uh, uh, <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm happy to listen to anything about Champlain. If I have anything wrong, I want to know it. But I, uh, uh, but I just found, I just found, the more I read about him, the more I wanted to read. So now I understand why he became so so upset. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> so he's a fascinating individual. Yeah, they remind me that he He's 400 years old, wasn't he? But he had a young wife, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. Now, the New Hampshire grant, is that why Isle of Mont was part of New York for a long time? Probably was. I couldn't tell you for sure, but probably, but probably was. I mean, there was no such thing as Vermont. The whole yeah. term hadn't come up. And, uh, and if you looked on, you know, I, I have found maps where, where it says Vermont. It says New Hampshire grant, so it was long enough People had a chance to print it. When I first read about it, I just figured, okay, this is another local, you know, kind of tradition or a local folklore. But uh, uh, I mean, it was smart. I mean, you put Bennington all the way on the New York border. <laughs> he made it clear he was going as far as south and as far west as he could. But I don't know that about Iowa. Uh, but uh, the the borders of the states are more fluid than I was led to uh, believe when they first made me memorize where all the states were. Yeah, in uh, 1790, Isle of Mont and Albert were considered part of Champlain, but the Republic of Vermont, so in 1790, they, Vermont did a census, and New York did a census, and surprisingly, they're not all the same. <laughs> each, each apparently miss different people, and you know, so all, not all the names are on both censuses. Ah, that's interesting. That's... Uh... Yeah, no, I didn't know that part, and it would fit with the with the chronology yeah. that they would do that. That's, I'm sure once Vermont became a state, it wanted to make sure it wasn't yielding a you know an inch of land anywhere uh, in the process. Uh, well, thank you all. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will say, like any, like any, I even have, you know, wait a minute. Well, I'm not going to try to do it. I even have a picture of Champlain meeting now, so I can thank you for. <laughs> I'm like I, I, I'm like all writers. I sell books, but I'm I'm not a very hard sell book person. But I will say the book I'm talking about is this. It's twenty two dollars. That's my expensive new book. Uh, this is my hundred twenty walks in New York, which is actually a really good book. This has been out for ten years. It's still current, except for one city that was wiped out in a hurricane. It's otherwise current. Uh, <coughs> And uh, this I sell for ten dollars because it's been out a long time. And then this one is a novel, which, although it revolves uh, to a certain degree about baseball, is not necessarily a baseball novel. And uh, in fact, uh, some of the people who have liked. In fact, I had a gentleman today who came up to me who just read it, and he's ninety, and uh, he's not a baseball fan, and he he was very he was very. Pleasing, so I was very pleased. So it's not just a baseball novel. And uh, the first person when I was writing it, I was taking, I went down to graduate writing courses in Skidmore for a few summers. And uh, the teacher, the professor, who was uh, who was assigned to me, and uh, had to read, had to spend an hour with me going over what I had written. He said, "I'm your perfect choice." I not only don't know anything about baseball, but I hate sports. <laughs> and so she gave me, and she said, all I'm going to give you is tips on writing. <laughs> and so she was really, she was really very really good. Uh, but that one's 14, and the only, I, I don't discount anymore because I don't want to compete with the stores. Uh, the only thing I discount is anybody who buys two, I knock $5 off. Anybody who buys three, I knock $10 off. But otherwise, uh, I'm very pleased that, that all these other places are, happy, are willing to carry my book. So I, I sell for the same price that they do.
Okay, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for